Good afternoon or evening, depending on what side of the pond you're on, and welcome to an extra special episode of Across the Pitch. We're the show for people who think Ma Maria was a movie featuring the music of ABBA. (laughs) (laughs) Hi. Now, of course, uh, the, the movie featuring the music of ABBA, which I've obviously never seen is Mama Mia, but Mom Rhea was a uh, a recent manager of Stevenage, and uh, we're here today for the fourth in our four-part series on uh, Stevenage FC, and well, let's just kick things back to the days of Ed McMahon at the Tonight Show. Here's Johnny. Hi there. Oh, what an introduction. Um, Actually, you know, um, what Mumre always made me think of is, uh, you know, growing up back in the 80s, I don't know if you remember Thundercats, yeah? I do, and I do. Mumra was, was the enemy of the Thundercats, wasn't he? So, <laughs> I, I was more of a, a Voltron guy myself. Oh, good choice, good choice. <laughs> okay, so... But, um, uh... But so, so just for, for those of, uh, who haven't heard the, the first three parts of this, back at the beginning of May, uh, Johnny Hibbert, who you may know from our Belarus special episodes, uh, decided to do uh, a Team of the Month segment on his favorite local club, Stevenage, or Stevenage Borough, as he prefers, and uh, he tells me that the locals also prefer. Uh, and so... Uh, it's been such a great series here that uh, what was going to be two shows over one month has now turned into four shows over two months. Uh, and when we left off at part three, where we were getting right about to 2010-ish, and uh, that's right around the time that, that Stevenage advanced to league football, much to the chagrin of my fellow Aki fans. Uh, but uh, we have uh, a decade of material, and Ma Maria doesn't uh, come up towards the end of the uh, the decade. So, so let's start back with uh, you know where we left off in part three. Yeah, well, of course, we've mentioned Ma Maria is a is a former. He was a former player actually, um, and ended up at Charleston Battery. But that's another story. But uh, yeah, so we we won the conference very very convincingly in um, 2010. There was a strange thing that season, though, because I was thinking particularly of the non-league fans uh, in England who were told this year basically that every game that they had been to in the 2019-20 season never happened. Okay? So the game (laughs) I went to, you know, a local game around here, Baseford United against uh, FC United of Manchester, didn't count for anything. Right, it's been. I, th- I believe the word is expunged. Um, and I was thinking, you know, have I ever been to any games that have ever been expunged? And in fact, in the season we won the conference, uh, we had two games expunged. And I went to one of them, which is away at um, Chester City, um, and it could have been very contentious because uh, we had won those games and Luton didn't win those games. So when they were expunged, you know, it made the title race a bit closer towards the end. Over here in the US, I would say games expunged is something that happens more often with uh, college sports, because what what happens a lot of times is like 10 years after the fact, they'll find that, you know, the star player, I, I, I remember Chris Weber at Michigan was a big one uh, where they found out that he was getting paid by boosters or something while well, well, he was at Michigan. And then, you know, like five years worth of their games just got wiped off the records. Oh, and it, it happens quite a bit. I, I can't really think of a whole lot of examples of it happening in professional sports over here, though. Yeah, yeah. So it was a really odd one. So to think that I, I yeah, I had actually been to a game that had been expunged. And uh, it's a place I used to live, actually, for a year. Um, Chester is on the 
England Wales border and the ground is actually divided between England and Wales. So if you're in the away section, you're sitting in Wales. But uh, I wanted to drop in just a random fact that has kind of nothing to do with anything, but it's about the word football, which kind of always gets um, people angry, doesn't it? So this whole kind of <laughs> soccer or football discussion. Yeah, that's one of the big things that, that we kind of ran into when we started this show is being uh, an American show about English football. It, it just, it, it's because over here, you know, especially just in terms of like trying to rank your website for, uh, you know, to, to come up for people to search, you know, people are going to key in the word soccer. So we have to put the word soccer on our website yeah. in places just to, to have people be able to find it. And then, you know, we read this ad on Facebook, you know, several times and it, it was a giant graphic and the, the giant graphic said uh, something like the, the U.S. show about English football or something like that. I, and then in a tiny little description area, it would say something <laughs> like, uh, you know, uh, a podcast about soccer. Every time we read the ad, the first comment we would get, it's not soccer, it's football. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, I mean, I'm going to slightly defend America's corner here very, very indirectly, because if you ever get the chance to go there, Chester is a really, really beautiful place. Unfortunately, where the football ground is, isn't beautiful, but Chester has a kind of intact set of medieval city walls that you can walk all the way around. Um, and on one side of these walls, uh, there is the famous Chester race course, which is the oldest horse racing course in England. Um, and on the side of this wall, there are these curious big metal rings, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason, apparently, that that is the oldest race course in England is because, historically, they used to play football on that area. Basically, when the sea went kind of retreated, you ended up with this big piece of flat land. And what did a typical Englishman think? What a perfect <laughs> place to play football, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Except oh, yeah. that except that football in those days wouldn't have been recognisable to what we know now. And basically, there was so much of violence and so many injuries from football that the city authorities said, look, guys, you're better off just watching horses race around a track, <laughs> right? And this kind yeah, of physical... Yeah, I mean, that thing, sounds like you know, very similar. We hear about the, the early days of American football. I know there was some time in the, in the early 1900s, I think there was a season with like 18 players died. So, yeah, I mean... Yeah. Sports, yeah. sports, uh, you know, 120 years ago and, and sports today are a whole different ball game. <laughs> no pun yeah. intended. Yeah. So there are still, there's, I think Atherston is one town in England that still has the annual uh, ball game, which is basically a giant ball and people basically beat the hell of each other, out of each other trying to get this ball between, you know, one end of the town or the other. So, and as you probably know, association football or soccer, you know, that was the rules of that were codified in um, the town where I was born, Cambridge. And when they codified that there would be no kicking people in the shins or carrying the ball with your hands, the other group stormed out angrily. Of course, they had a rival form of football, which became rugby. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess American football also. So it's actually... It all came out of the same game. And the kind of legacy of that, actually, in Stevenage's first season in the Football League, we went. I took my wife to her first ever English football match, which was uh, home to Lincoln City. And within about five minutes, you know, there were players crashing into each other. And she said, you know, did you see what he did? And I said, yeah, that's every week in English football. <laughs> right. Um, so that kind of physical side of it and the fact that English fans, you know, expect, you know, physical kind of involvement from their team and stuff. So I'm going to fight the corner of actually anybody who wants to call it football, because, you know, technically speaking, rugby, you know, America, they're all forms of football. So that's right, kind of right, how right, you explain right. it. That, that's kind of what, what I come down to is that. So, so for one, one of the big arguments that people always use is, well, it's a game that's played with your foot. But 
ultimately what was brought to my attention is that, that the fact that it was called football really had nothing to do with the fact that the ball was kicked with the foot but because the game was played on foot and not on horseback, as you were mentioning <laughs> earlier. Uh, and then, uh, you, you know, what, what it really comes down to is when you're doing a, a global show like this, if you say football uh, in America, if you say football in England, if you say football in Australia, and even if you say football in Canada, because even though Canadian football is essentially the same game as American football. It's still a little bit different. There's you know, different numbers of players on the field. So you look at four different countries, yeah. football means well, four there's actually different things. Gaelic football in Ireland as well. That's one of the most perplexing things I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, I've heard um, about that. That's a brutal game I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you say um, soccer, everybody knows what you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, so it's not my favorite word, but actually it's also our word. Um, we just don't exactly. use it. So, yeah, well, because um, it's like you said, it's a shortened form of the word association. So, I mean, you, you know, for a while I was just saying association football all the time. But, yeah, that <laughs> that just gets so... so that could get hard. tiresome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because um, I, I think, it, you know, the attitude to, to watching football in America has changed so much. I mean, you'll remember, um, is it John Harkes, who um, his parents, I think, were Scottish. And he was, you know, in America 20 years ago saying things like 2-0, you know. <laughs> and in those days, people were quite confused by that. But these days, I don't think they are. So, you know, it's yeah, changed you know, a lot. really, it kind of... Started in 1994 with the uh, the World Cup, and, and you know, I just I remember back in the 90s, there there was almost like a a war, if you will, where you know, if you were an American football fan, you couldn't like soccer, and if you liked soccer, you couldn't like American football, and you know, it, it was kind of once that silliness fell by the wayside that I I think. Uh, the, the game finally kind of started to be embraced more here. And then, yeah, I mean, I just remember there was just so much silliness in the 90s. And there was, there was the whole, um, you know, soccer's boring because nobody scores. But, you know, what the funny thing about American football is, is because, you know, a, a touchdown ultimately normally leads to seven points. So if you have a game that's 21-14, that's really 3-2. to two. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, how much higher scoring really is it? Yeah, no, I totally agree. So I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2010. And I actually, I was about to go across to the States because uh, my wife was uh, working down in Florida for a while before we got married. But I delayed my flight just enough to witness uh, the first Stevenage game in the Football League. And it was at home, too. It had to be. Who else could it be but Macclesfield Town? Yeah. OK. Um, and, you know, it's one of those kind of quiz questions, probably a local quiz question. But who scored uh, the first ever Stevenage goal in the Football League uh, was a chap called Peter Vincenti who I believe is still kicking around the Football League somewhere. I don't remember where. What we would call a lanky chap in England. But, uh, yeah, so he scored the first goal. Then Macclesfield went 2-1 up. But this time they didn't quite spoil the party. And and we got back. We ended 2-2. And then that was okay. And then, they're up, you know, three days later, there was the rather awkward League Cup game against Portsmouth that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, the team in that season was recognisably the same team that had won the conference uh, the previous season. And when you look at the CVs of all of those players, they all came from non-league. You know, uh, pretty much all came from non-league. And there were one or two additions to the squad. There was one uh, addition to the squad that was absolutely crucial, who we'll talk about, you know, a little bit later. Um, and to be honest... 
I think it was really when we got to League One that you really start to see a different product. I don't, I'm not totally in the loop with the conference and what it's like these days, but the standard of football is higher in League Two, but it's not massively higher. Um, it's, you know, it's really League One where they start playing football. Um, That's been so my it's, understanding. I, I mean, unfortunately, over here, it's almost impossible for me to, to watch conference matches. But, you know, from, from speaking with players, they basically told me that the the biggest difference is once you get to League One, that's when you have the, the start of the really skilled strikers. And it's also when you see less of the long ball teams. Yeah, yeah. And and that's why also with Stevenage, you know, pretty much confirmed to be going down, but subject to a couple of caveats. You know, they're already building now a, a team for next season, which is, you know, definitely going to be competitive at conference level. But if we were suddenly reprieved and put into League Two, then I think those, you know, players would probably be useful enough for for League Two as well. So it's not uncommon for teams to get up to the conference and then pretty much breeze through League Two. A lot of teams have done it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the way back in the 90s, I think Wickham Wanderers were the first ones I can remember. Wickham City. uh, Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is quite a common thing for teams to be able to do that. So I don't know if I was that surprised that we went on to have a really good season in League Two. And the teams we were playing, you know, they're one or two biggish teams, I suppose, for that level, Rotherham United and things. But, But we weren't playing you know we weren't playing that many teams that we hadn't played before uh, in some capacity so although it was the promised land although it was league football you know I almost think really what makes the difference between the conference and the football league is the kind of bottleneck between them because it's only two up two down uh, and it used to only be one up one down you know, um, and as we said, you know, in the past, they they would often not allow teams up anyway. I still think it is a bit of a bottleneck because of how stupid the conference playoffs are. You know, these Im- eliminators where the seventh place team, you know, still has a, a chance to get into the Football League. And I, I think a place in the Football League should be a, a little bit more sacred than that, personally. But, you know, that season we played, you know, a lot of... Um, Quite familiar teams, I would say, as well as some new ones. You know, I talked previously uh, about the the big surprise that season, which was beating Newcastle United um, 3-1 in the FA Cup uh, and getting uh, revenge uh, for our defeat back in 1998. um, But, you know, we went kind of consistently well through the season. I know that we played and beat Accrington in the playoff semi-finals and I probably I was abroad but I probably watched those games because they were on TV but I honestly don't remember them um, <laughs> because they always say that <laughs> yeah I mean the, um, the uh, that, that 2011 Accrington team I, I think that, that one of the big things there was at the end of the season everybody was out of contract so it was kind of like a, a one time shot with that that squad and you, you know, I, I think it's just, yeah, I, I think you you know uh, what, what it's like when you have that that squad where you're like, okay, this is our one year, our one shot. We're not going to be able to bring these players back. And yeah, even though Accrington's made it all the way up to League One, I, I think there's a, a lot of folks that, that still look at that 2011 season as a, a missed chance for, for Accrington. Yeah, it's often a shame when you don't go up and then you... I mean, this happens to, you know, teams every year. So you, you don't oh, go up and then you invariably lose the, the sort of two, three stars of your team. And I think the same, you know, the same was true for us because when we got to the League One playoffs, you know, after that, that's exactly what happened. But, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry to say, but, you know, the losing semi finalist is often forgotten. Um, we went to, you know, a very interesting final. I, I watched it from, from a pub in Kiev, as he had to in those days. But uh, it was a very, very interesting game because we were playing Torquay United. Um, but I think most people really had, you know, unlike myself, I suppose, I, maybe I just bear grudges a bit better. But most people had forgotten, you know, the 96 stuff. 
The interesting thing about that game is that it was played at Old Trafford um, because Wembley was being used for the Champions League final the same day. Um, and it was, I think it was Guardiola's great uh, Barcelona team that beat Manchester United uh, that same evening. So we had a bit of fun because, uh, you know... Steve, Steve and Agent Torquay didn't quite have the, the pull to boot out United in Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I mean, we could claim that we were the team playing at Old Trafford that won a trophy that day. <laughs> hey, there you <laughs> so go. It wasn't so bad. <laughs> um, and what I really liked about it is, obviously, you know, Manchester's quite a long way from Stevenage, and it's an even longer way from Torquay. So you didn't really get those fair weather people that annoy me turning up. You've got, you know, 11,500 people who really, really wanted to be there and were really, really desperate to win. So it was a really, really fantastic atmosphere at that game. You know, it's a plenty of noise considering it was only, I don't know, a fifth full. Yeah, and the guy that changed that game was uh, John Massinho. Um, now. There was he'd pulled off this trick more than once, but obviously Torquay hadn't done their homework. Basically, the ball was laid off to him um, a good 25, 30 yards out, and he was able to just hit a daisy cutter perfectly along the ground into the bottom corner. And, and one goal was enough. And amazingly, at the end of that game, I mean, I just remember posting on, I think it was Facebook, just in amazement, you know, Steven Idger in League One. I hear because I literally couldn't oh, believe I it. I know what you mean. It's just one of those things where, you know, you, you just savor that. It's, it's as good as winning the World Cup when you're a small club. And, and yeah, I mean, th this is a little bit off topic, but this is just a quick question I wanted to ask you. Mm. Any, any particular reason Old Trafford it? It seems like it would have made more sense to find some other stadium in London, like you know, played at the Arsenal Stadium or something that, you know, make everybody travel all the way to Manchester. I think, yeah, these decisions are never that logical because they're always made much, much earlier. Yeah. yeah? So it's always, you know, ordained pretty much a year earlier where it's going to host the final. And I was kind of thinking now that we've had, you know, the script was kind of torn up this year in world football and they're arranging things at much more short notice. You know, they've just basically ar arranged for the Champions League to be in Portugal, haven't they? And I'm just wondering if now people are going to say, do you know what? It's okay sometimes to like change plans and, and, you know, arrange something that's easier for everybody. Um, oh yeah. I know what you mean. I, uh, I hadn't even realized that they rescheduled the, the FA cup and then, uh, about, uh, Midnight on uh, Friday night, I realized I had to be up at five to watch Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I hope it was worth it. Really, I think we get into the big time in the 2011 to 12 um, season um, because that's when we start to play some very big teams and not only play big teams, uh, but beat them, you know? And the squad was kind of added to um, quite intelligently, I would say. So, um, you know, we got we started to get in our first sort of loan signings from higher levels. Um, we saw, I think possibly Patrick Adjiman was the first player we signed that I'd previously heard of. And, yeah, so what was amazing that season is just some of these results that come up, and I'll just go through some of them with you. We beat Sheffield Wednesday 5-1 at home. Oh. Yeah. We then a few weeks later beat Sheffield United 2-1 at home. And there's a bit of a... Those are big, big clubs, I mean. Yeah, big scalps. And and the thing is, I think, um, sometimes when you're a big club, um, those games don't really help you. I'm not going to go for the cliche that it was sort of our cup final to be playing. Sheffield Wednesday, because I don't think that's quite true. But certainly, you know, I notice when very big teams have come down to the conference that they, they think basically they've got a, a divine right to, to win the game before they've kicked the ball. You know, well, I, think I think you see a lot of that even with like Sunderland and Ipswich in League One. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely the same thing. Um, 
And I think, you know, when you're the big team, if it's not going for you in the first 20 minutes, then actually the fans are getting on your back because they're saying, oh, you know, this is Yeovil or whatever, we should be beating this lot. So, you know, in, in, in one way they're right, but, you know, we don't, you know, if we decided every football match on just counting the number of fans, we wouldn't need to have a game, would we? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. um, so, that, you know, that those were quite surreal times, you know. Um, you know One was- thing that, that you brought up was, uh, it's kind of an interesting side note, when you, you said that, that Stephen and sure that the first time side to player that, that you'd already heard of, I, I, I know that feeling. It's kind of exciting when the, the Phoenix Rising made a, a couple of, of signings this offseason. Like they, they signed Santi Moore was uh, was one. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, hey, they're, they're starting to sign guys I've already heard of. I got excited. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So but having said that, I mean, the, um, the uh, uh, bedrock of the team was this group of players that had come up from the conference. And like I say, it was a bit analogous to that Bournemouth team that had, you know, the same kind of core of the team that went up two divisions. Um, very similar, you know, the club had the momentum, but the momentum was slightly broken by the fact that in March of 2012, Graham Wesley's um, head was turned by Preston North End, you know, who are, you know, a big club, um, you know, with a great, long tradition uh, in English football. And I suppose in fairness to him that he thought, you know, this phone call may never come again. So he um, went to Preston, but um, Phil Wallace was quite clever on this occasion uh, and made a uh, clause in the contract that he was uh, not allowed to uh, raid the Stevenage players, certainly not until the end of that season. (laughs) Because, you know, as I mentioned ages yeah, ago... Yeah. Um, he knows how, how he operates. <laughs> well, that was how Wesley first came to Stevenage, by um, bringing the, the Farnborough Five, mm-hmm. you know, very controversially. So I think uh, Wallace could see what was coming and decided that that needed to be a condition of it. And that's good, because that was crucial in us making the playoffs that year. And then Gary Smith came in and actually I, I liked Gary Smith. He was a nice guy. Um, and he kept it ticking over till the end of that season. So there was, um, you know, we had a really, really epic um, run of um, good results uh, towards the end of that season, finished really, really strongly, went up to uh, Bramall Lane and drew 2-2 with Sheffield United in front of 30,000 people. You know, that was a really, really far cry from uh you know our non-league days so but i suppose you know this was the point it it would have been an amazing achievement if we had got three promotions in a row from the conference that has never been done and i think you know we were very very unfortunate in the semi-finals it was one nil on aggregate you know as a game in the fairly late uh goal in the fairly late stages of the second leg uh, away to Sheffield United ended the dream. And Any after time that, you have a, a two-legged uh, affair like that, and then the first game is nil deal, uh, and then it's nil nil going into the second half of the second game still, and then you can see that that's just one of those stomach punch games. Yeah, and and yeah, you never really know if it would have been a good thing for the club because. Yeovil obviously really, really struggled when they got to the championship. Burton didn't seem to find it easy. So, um, but to get those three promotions in a row, I think you know that would have been such a historic achievement um, yeah. with those set with that same core of players. The one other kind of exciting thing that happened that season were were more um, FA Cup heroics. So uh, we went on to the fifth round. Uh, and played Tottenham Hotspur. And I hope you beat him. Well, I'd love to say that we did. <laughs> um, we drew nil-nil with them at home. And uh, across the uh, street from the football ground in Stevenage, uh, is it's usually parking for the club, but it's nominally a fairground. So at certain types of the year, there'll be a circus set up there. So there was... 
you know, all these pictures in the paper of well, there, there's uh, a, there's a circus twelve months a year. It's called the Spurs Training Ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have no love for Tottenham. I have to say, I've no much, as yeah. a, as an Arsenal Either supporter, I'm just contractually obligated to to make some kind of a Spurs crack. Yeah, yeah. So you know, Spurs particularly, but Arsenal as well, slightly. You know, a bit of a sore point for me coming from that area, coming from Hertfordshire, and seeing how you know the bright lights of the big city tend to sweep up most of the young football fans who, you know, um, could be coming to watch their local team. Um, And, you know, God bless the the ones that do. I kind of have the opposite story being from from the U.S. is that, you know, obviously the the Premier League was, you know, the, the only exposure that you have over here is whatever Premier League games are on TV. So then I started following Arsenal and then, following the Premier League is, is what led me to, to want to learn about the other leagues below and, you know, eventually start supporting Accrington. So it's kind of the opposite for me where, you know, it, it's funny, like if I, basically, if I had never started watching Arsenal, I would have never gotten to the lower leagues. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Some, sometimes and- it does work the opposite, but I, I think it has to do with being, you know, uh, from, from a foreign country, like like our uh, our friend Subaru in Ghana, he uh, you know has always been a Liverpool supporter, but but now he supports Accrington also. And I I think you yeah. know you have to have that that introduction to the game, uh, you know, if you don't live in England. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's true. Um, you know, when I look at say ice hockey, which is the American sport, I can must get into. I don't think I would have started with one of the. <laughs> kind of hockey minor leagues uh, in Canada or something. I'm sure Two, they're great. Tucson Roadrunners. I, I recommend the Tucson Roadrunners <laughs> if you're looking for a, a minor league hockey team. Well, you know what? When you watch it in Britain, I mean, Cardiff Devils and Nottingham Panthers is kind of <laughs> obscure enough, I think. I think our experience of watching hockey in England must be very similar in some ways to your experience of watching football in the US. You know, you're a kind of clan of people who are just there for it um <laughs> not, not everyone understands it but you know that's okay so um yeah we didn't beat them um but we uh uh drew nil nil and went away to, to uh white heart lane and another sign that stevenage had finally made it was that our game was being broadcast around the world right so i was sitting in on my sofa <laughs> in ukraine uh, at home watching oh, Stephen. Wow. Yeah. And seeing seeing uh, the name of the club written in Ukrainian letters and stuff. So, you know, That's we awesome. took Yeah, it was. It was. And I must say the Stevenage fans uh, did us proud because um, you know, the noise there was you know, all the songs I knew were kind of coming out of my T V, you know, one and a half thousand miles away. So I know so, I know what you mean. There's uh there's been about over the past two years. There's been about five Accrington games that have been broadcast on what's called ESPN Plus over here, uh, and, and whatever that happens, I'm like calling everybody. This is your chance. This is your chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the time to get the, the casual follower on board. I'm not sure. We, yeah, I'm not sure we rivaled the Kidderminster guy in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> You were, yeah, Stevenage actually took the lead in that game uh, with the penalties. So, you know, whatever else happens after that, it was 3-1 to Spurs in the end. But, you know, again, you know, fantastic moments, fantastic memories that I don't think we'll see for a long time. What I would say um, is if you support any um, team in England outside of that kind of typical top five in the Premier League, most of those other teams have been relegated one time or another, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the only teams that haven't been relegated are uh, Arsenal, Tottenham, uh, Manchester United, Chelsea, Everton, yeah. and uh, what, oh, Liverpool. Yeah, every yeah. Even, even Man City's been, been relegated twice, I think. Well, Man City, I think, were the ones I, I was going to mention because... 
they went all the way down to League One at one stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, they were right, playing right. Um, Macclesfield in the league. You know? um, and, you know, when Manchester City were first poised to win their first Premier League title, you know, the media were slightly arrogantly um, interviewing Man City fans and saying, oh, you know, this is much better, isn't it, than the days when you were playing uh, games against Macclesfield Town in the third division. And actually, you know, some of those Man City fans said, uh, don't diss those days. You know, those were good days. And in a way, they are. You know, mm. you go on a journey and the journey takes you to to good places and, and, and not so good places. But, you know, it's all part of the journey. I've noticed what you're saying is that there, there there's almost like two groups of City fans. So there's that. That whole joke that goes around that's like Manchester City established 2011 or or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But it, it's, you know, there is that, certainly the, the bandwagon fans, but it, it's anybody that did support City during those tough times, you know, they're uh, they're the same kinds of fans as we are that, uh, yeah. you, you know, just, uh, you know, support their team no matter what. Exactly. And you, you know what? We kind of we're starting to come to terms with being back in the conference next season. Um, I'm moving down to London and it's amazing how quickly priorities change because rather than worrying about the that we're gonna be in the conference, now my big worry is in London there are five potential away games and what I'm stressing about is whether or not I'll be able to go to them. Um, so, you know, for me, actually, the, the, the journey sometimes is, you know, you take the good times with the bad times and you remember, you know, you'll say to unbelieving, you know, kids in a few years, oh, you know, we want to beat Sheffield Wednesday 5-1 in the league. So, um, we then get on to the following season, um, and Gary Smith didn't have such a good season that year. Yeah, I think we would have stayed up anyway. I'm going to ask you an odd trivia question. I don't suppose you will know the answer, but during that season, pictures of a player in a Stevenage shirt were beamed around the world on, you know, TV news channels, CNN, um, Euro News over in Europe, and so on. Do you have any idea why? Do you know who the player was? Uh, you, you've got me on that one. Okay, if I say that he was an American player. Um, who was on loan at Stevenage from Leeds United. Um, I'm talking about Robbie Rogers. Ah. Yeah. So I, you know, was sort of having my porridge in the morning, look up. Uh, I think we were in Poland by then. Look up, and there's a guy in a Stevenage shirt, you know, on the world news. Um, and it's because Robbie Rogers, the last team that he actually played for before he temporarily uh, retired, was... Stevenage. And of course, that led to lots of introspection amongst Stevenage players about what they'd said that maybe they shouldn't have said or whatever. But yeah, I just thought I'd throw in that bit of trivia that again showed that we were sort of on the world stage. uh, And of course, it wouldn't last. So that season, um, a lot of the kind of established players, you know, got the phone call to go to those bigger clubs and did so. And, you know, some of them did go to Preston. But Graham Wesley, Graham Wesley's time at Preston was, uh, how shall I say, you know, it didn't work out that well. Um, and he... It, I, I, I I've think read some things, stuff about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about him is obviously he's, you know, quite an eccentric um, coach with some quite odd practices. Uh, he's clearly a workaholic. I think he has a a business consultancy in addition to um, working in football. Um, So he's just one of those people that sort of 24-7 is on it. And I think the thing is at Stevenage, he was able to build it in his own image without too much scrutiny. You know, I mean, we're a sort of ragtag bunch. And if the team is is doing all right, you know, we're not going to worry too much about what's going on at the training ground or whatever. But at Preston, you know, as soon as you're at a bigger club with a lot more, you know, it would have been fanzines in those days, but, you know, a lot more kind of fan groups and a lot more scrutiny on you. And I think that just so many stories 
came out about him from that time that were kind of not very flattering. And, and you've probably heard the famous quotation when he signed for the club. He is quoted as saying, my kids don't call me dad, they call me medal winner. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds um, like something uh, Zlatan would say. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he he uh, kind of publicly slated the players and the squad in a way that they were not used to. Some of these were quite experienced players and quite pampered. So, and he said things like, "This playing squad hasn't got a clue what it takes to get success." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, his way of doing things um, just didn't really work. So I don't know if this was the right decision, but Phil Wallace saw an opportunity uh, to bring back Graham Wesley uh, the following March, um, and Gary Smith was on his way. Uh, and to be honest, we hadn't had a very good um, season. Um um, it was a bit strange because we had just had one really, really good result. We had just beaten um, Sheffield United 4-0 at home. So that's not bad going. Um, right. But uh, I believe Gary Smith was fired about um, four days after that game. You can't, you know, you can't just pick up where you've left off uh, in that situation. Um, so because... You know, the, the players that had made us so successful had all gone. You know, I mean, Graham Wesley had actually taken some of those players away. So when he came back, he had a few games that we, we had a few games that we lost. Uh, and um, we had players that Wesley didn't really like. Um, the Canadian Marcus Haber, who's now playing for Pacific FC in the um, Canadian Premier League. But, you know, the, these were players that Wesley wasn't that fond of. So we ended that season really, really poorly and didn't do well the following season either. So um, the guy that had taken us up took us down. And of course, had he not been fired um, in uh, March this year, he'd have taken us down two divisions, not just one. <laughs> so um, by then, I mean, I think if Graham Wesley had just stayed for 10 years, he could have really built. Uh, a legacy, and I, I, to my mind, it's it's too much his company fault. going. Yeah, it's kind of his fault that he went to Preston that that didn't happen. I think, or I think it's one of the reasons. So you know, we had one more season in League One. Um, I mean, I kind of regret that because I was abroad, I didn't personally get to that many of these games. But you know, we were still playing some quite big clubs. So that season, we were playing. Uh, you know, Wolves, teams like that. But that didn't end that well for us, and we went down. And then we had, you know, a reasonably good season the next year in League Two. We got to the League Two playoffs. Um, you yeah, know, I remember Dean Parrott scoring, um, you know, a peach of a goal um, against Southend United uh, in the playoff um, semifinals. But in the end, you know, we ran out of steam against them. And I really want to pick up after that, because, you know, I came back to England uh, in 2016. And so that kind of made it a very different era for me because suddenly I was back here and could regularly go to games, particularly in the Midlands. You know, we went through, um, you know, most of those games, they were kind of all right, you know. So we generally, you know, performed reasonably well. We might win, we might not. We had one particularly good run towards the end of the uh, 2016-17 season. Um, so we had uh, Darren Saul as the manager then, who was a, a young coach from the area who'd been involved with the club for a long time. I really liked him. And we put together um, an amazing um, run that very, very nearly made the playoffs. Uh, and then just kind of ran out of steam towards the end of that season. So, for example, Stevenage were the only team to take six points off the champions that season. The champions were Portsmouth that uh, year. But um, I want to really kind of cut to the chase of actually um, our last full season in the Football League, because I'm not even going to count 
you know, season 19 to 20, that was three quarters of a season. It, it wasn't a yeah, season. Let's just, let's just, yeah, let's talk about the, the, the yeah. fourth season, the 2018-19. Yeah, and I have to say um, that there were signs that season of what was to come. So until January of that year, it was not really a spectacular season. Uh, Darren Sahl had been uh, replaced by uh, Dino Mamria, okay? Um, and <laughs> Dino Mamria, had, yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd done well in non-league. I mean, he had been managing in um, Conference North and he'd got hold of, I think it was Nuneaton, who were doing really, really badly um, and kind of shook some sense into them and put a really, really good run together that kept them up. But, you know, that's yeah, two he's levels. A, he, he's a really interesting uh, guy. I was I was doing some research on him. Uh, and it, whenever I do my, my opening joke, I usually like to uh, you know, come up with some, some little research that I have done. And, and so I, I noticed that so he is uh, uh, originally from Tunisia. And at mm-hmm. one time, uh, he was the only uh, African-born manager in the English Football League. And and like you said, he played uh he obviously both played and managed at Stevenage. He came over and, and played with the uh the Charleston battery and yeah he, he was kind of a guy I saw that that he uh he played with Stevenage it looked three different occasions and yeah you know, I, I know you had brought him up earlier but I just kinda of wanted to go go a little bit in in depth on him now, and yeah, uh, he just seemed like um, a a big part of the franchise's history. I think so. Um, and he was assistant to Graham Wesley during that really successful period as well. The other piece of trivia about him, which is fantastic, is being from Tunisia. Um, he actually spent his early years uh, living in a tent. I did um, see that. I did see that. You know, having, you know, he was always a football fan, I guess. Uh, as a child, they had a pet goat and he had to name his pet goat. So he naturally called his pet goat Gary Lineker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, what can I say? I mean, in one way, he's a great character. I think in the end, though, we were taking a manager. We should, you know, looking at it in, in a kind of, cold-hearted way we were taking a manager from conference north and expecting him to do a job for us in league two which you know he did for a while but you know there was a game in january uh 2019 um which i think should have set alarm bells ringing so i went down to stevenage for a home game against our friends at forest green okay <laughs> and everybody forest- club Wow, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Forest Green were, were, were pretty terrible that day, but went away with the three points. And why? Because uh, we just looked really, really poor, really directionless. So it looked like, I don't think we were really in, in danger of, of being relegated, but it was certainly looking like it was going to be an un, uninspiring remainder to the season. I had kind of figured out that the the easiest way to to get beat up in England would be to wear a half and half scarf of Forest Green and MK Dons. <laughs> yeah, I think when Forest Green first got promoted, their first League Cup tie was it was against Milton Keynes. Um, people said that's pretty much the most kind of anti football tie you can think of. <laughs> There was um, a very, very um, inspired loan signing at the beginning of 2019 that basically changed everything. And this is a chap, I think he will always go down in Stevenage folklore, even as just a loan signing. Uh, So the guy's name is Ilias Chair. Okay. He's currently 22 years old um, and plays for Queen's Park Rangers. And what you need to know about him. Uh, he's Belgian, um, I think of North African descent, and um, grew up in Antwerp, in, basically grew up in an apartment block in um, Antwerp in Belgium, you know, p- playing on a clay pitch uh, near the house. 
And, you know, there are a number of things I like about him, but he's very, very small. He's five foot two. Okay. So you have to imagine. We know, have somebody... a uh, we have a five foot two player at Phoenix Rising who is MVP of the league, Solomon Asante. Uh, so you you know you you never know that there's sometimes the, the best player in the whole league could be five foot two. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's certainly it's a learning curve for that kind of a player to learn what they can do and to learn what they can't. You know, so if you talk about. You know, a league like League Two, which is very, very tough, very, very physical, you know, full of big, burly guys who are going to push you off the ball for 80 minutes of the game. You know, you've really got to sort of learn how to play smart in that situation. And he did. And, and I would say, you know, these days he is um, doing well at Queen's Park Rangers. You know, he's scored a few goals. And if he never quite makes it at the top level, uh, and I don't mean this disparagingly at all. He's the kind of player I can imagine being a big hit in a league like the MLS. Because, you know, if, as you said, you know, the MLS has got less of an emphasis on defensive players, oh, no, I'm, I'm more of an emphasis I don't, on attacking uh, players. I, I don't um, look at that as, as disparaging at all. I just look at it as around the league, around the world, different leagues have a, a different style of play. I mean, and and by far, I think the, the English leagues are, are among the most physical in the world. I mean, even, you know, if you go to Spain or or even, you know, like Germany, uh, you know, those leagues are nearly as physical as the English leagues. Mm, yeah. The, th- the thing about Elias Chair that I liked as well is that he's, he's a, a very, very um, genuine guy. And, you know, his family are wonderful. You know, if you tweet about him you know often it will be like his father or i think it's his father who will like like or share your tweet and stuff and you know when you you look at him he's one of these players who's always very eager to you know um take a photo with the kids or give them an autograph or you know give them a high five or whatever it is you know he kind of gets that that's part of a player's responsibility but anyway it was none of those things that's that's part of the the charm of supporting lower league teams and uh you know I- interestingly enough we were just talking about solomon asante uh i actually uh ordered his replica shirt and i uh, got it in the mail the other day and i i posted a, a picture of, of the shirt on twitter uh, you know, he personally uh, liked the post. He actually follows me on Twitter. You're not going to get that kind of thing with a Premier League team. You're not going to go out and buy Harry Kane shirt and have him like it on Twitter. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a bit like me having um, Jan Sane follow me on Twitter, but I'm kind of sweating blood at the moment because Jan Sane is apparently going to Shakhtar Soligorsk. Uh, so if that happens, oh, you might wow. have to pick me up in a couple of weeks. Anyway, so getting back to Elias Chair. So, of course, it was none of those things that really made him sort of famous for us. It was, you know, the fact that this player has got, you know, an awesome um, shot, very sharp shooting player. So he scored goals. He scored six goals. Some of them were spectacular. One was from the halfway line. Just a very, very tricky player i mean my brother said you know when he was running he was reminiscent of maradona so you know enormously talented but i think for various reasons he's kind of struggled to break through and i had a couple of fantastic kind of experiences of seeing him play in person one was away at lincoln city so not far from where i live and i you know shouldn't really have been there because i had the flu that day but in those old days we didn't worry about quarantine <laughs> so um and to be honest i mean lincoln they they went on to get promoted um that season but um you know they were beating us 2-0 and we were we were playing okay i was you know i was going to go away feeling reasonably happy that we'd had a go you know i'm quite easily pleased these days um and you then know, all the of us with, uh... With Lincoln, it is, you know, I can almost see them having similar to a Graham Wesley issue with, with Cowley because he kind of got them up to League One and then left and doesn't seem mm. to be doing quite as well since he left. I mean, it, 
it's just something that that so often happens. I, I mean, I, I think with, with Accrington, we kind of looked out where uh, you know Coleman kind of took that wood shot at, at Rochdale, and then you know, came back and decided, you know, like like you said, I'm just going to spend ten years at Accrington and, and build from there. But I mean. You know, look, like, look at Nathan Jones. He, he's the same thing. He brought Luton up, went over to Stoke, didn't have any success. Now he's back <laughs> at Luton. I mean, yeah. it's just well, something you, that you see so often. Well, you might have heard today that Ian Everett left mm. Barrow to go to Bolton Wanderers. I, I was <laughs> going to say that. And, and you know, the, the funny thing is, is that picture of Ian Everett holding the, the Bolton Wanderers scarf uh, I sent that picture over to, to Aaron Ayers, who's one of our other co-hosts, and I said, this picture has the look of, what have I done on his face? I'll, I'll send the picture over to you, because he just kind of has this look at the, his face of, yeah. what what have I done holding this Bolton scarf? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And and just like Graham Wesley in... Um, you know, 2011 to 12, you know, we'll never know what he could have done with Barrow now. You know, that yeah. story is going to be changed. Yeah, so we were at Lincoln. Um, Lincoln City had put us in, a, you know, a really sort of strange corner of their stadium. It was sort of part of one stand and part of another. Uh, you know, nothing could make you feel more sort of neglected as an away supporter. So, you know, the game was winding down and all of a sudden, uh, Elias Chair comes up with two world-class long-distance goals whipped in from long range. And, you know, I'll obviously have to, to send you his goals on social media. Um, yeah, put but it yeah, on was, Twitter. It was world-class. I mean, everyone who's seen his goals is just like, whoa. So for my sort of final act, I uh, asked Stephen Itch, Series, like I say, I'm pretty much blanking this season for, for lots of very, very I don't, I don't good reasons, and we, you know, we've discussed it at length. And the only real question, because we had, you know, a fantastic run under Elias Chair, and other players were really feeding off it. You know, people like Curtis Guthrie, you know, was just thriving on the service. He looked like a world beater, and we, we just wonder if. Elias Chair is kind of indirectly responsible for relegating us because, you know, he made us really... Everyone wants that moment when you feel your club is a world beater um, and, you know, gave us some fantastic moments, but also gave us, you know, way too high expectations um, after he left. But yeah, so the last game that I'm going to talk about is possibly the last game that I'll ever have seen us win in the Football League um, because I went to uh, 13 games this season and you won't be surprised to hear that none of them were wins. So, And this was, again, another game local to me up at um, Mansfield Town. Now, Mansfield Town is, um, I find it a strange club uh, for lots of reasons. From my, first time, my memory, they they made the playoffs and lost to Newport last year, and then they got off to a decent start this year and then started really struggling. Yeah, I mean, the reason that they were in the playoffs last year and not in the automatic promotion spot is because we spoiled the party, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I um, remember that uh, now. Yeah, yeah. So the first time I went up to Mansfield, for a game and I just decided to go up on the day. They had a, a policy of being all ticket only for away fans, which means you needed to buy your ticket in advance. And I knew nothing about it. So I had to hide out uh, with the locals and do my best East Midlands mm -hmm. accent and pretend not to celebrate. But, you know, a pretty good record against them over the years. That particular day, uh, you know, there was a big crowd. I should mention as well, the worst thing about going to Mansfield Town they have quite a good stadium on three sides. But on the fourth side, I can only really describe it as, you know, there have been these um, memes going around this year, you know, if 2020 was a car and it will be mm -hmm. some awful car or something like that. Well, basically, if 2020 
were a, were a football club stand, football stadium <laughs> stand, it would be uh, the abandoned stand at Mansfield Town, which is oh, a terrible God. eyesore. It basically should have been demolished years ago. It's not used. They've covered it in sort of advertising hoardings, and it just looks like a sort of stillborn kind of uh, excuse for a stand. You know, it's it's really, really sad. Um, so, uh, again, I'll, I'll send you a pic of that. But, um, you know, it was a big day. Um, and I had, you know, being local up here, I had friends who were in the home fans, which made it more fun. And, you know, I think Mansfield fans that year definitely fancied uh, automatic promotion that day. And, um, you know, we got to half time. It was nil nil. Wasn't sure if it was going to be our day. Elias Chair comes up with brilliant service to um, Curtis Guthrie, who puts us 1 0 up. Then we had an absolutely comical equalizer where um, basically our goalkeeper, our sort of defender, was um, missold a kind of back pass to the goalkeeper. And it's just one of those really comical and embarrassing goals that I think only happens in League Two. But, um, you know, we were taking on towards a 1-1 draw um, and Chair actually had been kept out of the game quite well. Like you say, like I say, kind of big, stocky League Two defenders, you know, keeping basically this kid, you know, knocking him off the ball pretty effortlessly. You know, there was knockdown to him in the 90th minute and he scored uh, at Mansfield. And it was just, you know, another fantastic memory um and i certainly you know if anyone wishes he'd never played for the club well i'm not one of those people so if that was you know the last win i was to see in the the football league uh with stevenage then it was you know quite something and uh you know, yeah, my friends yeah. in the home fans were telling me, you know, because a lot of the guys that go to these games in sort of working class towns, they're often like teenagers and things with lots of kind of pent up energy and stuff. And he was talking about how some of these low were really losing it at the end in, in yeah. terrible frustration. So sorry for them, but, you know, um, so that was a brilliant day. Again, that's part of the journey, you know, whoever you are. Um, you should have that day when you feel like a world beater. Um, and, and that was it. That's the beauty of the the whole promotion and, and relegation system and the playoff battle is that, you know, it just makes it so that, that every game matters and you can have that special memory, even if it's not a day that you're lifting the trophy. Yeah. And, you know, when days come round again, we'll know not to take it for granted. You know, yeah. if we ever are playing, you know, Leeds United in the league or something, we'll know, do you know <laughs> what, this happen every day, enjoy it. And I would say that, to, say that to Accrington fans, you know, you're playing Sunderland now, but, you know, it might not last. <laughs> oh, every, every day, I, I think that that's something that your Accrington fans definitely don't take for granted, and, and that's part of, you know, the, the the beauty of following a, a small team is, you know, like you said, you can really, you know, kind of savor those moments of, you know, hey, we, for instance, when we beat Ipswich this year, or, you know, beating Bolton 7-1, to one, I mean, those are just things that, you know, uh, those, those are memories that, you know, they're, they're as big as any uh, trophy is, you, you know, it's like, you know, if you support a team like manchester united you know it's not not every day you're gonna get that kind of satisfaction out of a, a victory just because the Absolutely. expectations are so much yeah yeah so they'll, they'll in a way they'll never quite feel like we do you know unless it was sort of champions league final in 1999 or something <laughs> you know they'll never yeah. quite have that feeling that we can have so and you just have to look at it and say well do you know what the 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 leagues in you know i think particularly in english football because i think in america because it's more sort of centralized and there isn't promotion and relegation so that the, the league itself and whether the league is being run well and doing is, is kind of more important there, right? And in England, yeah. Yeah. the league yeah. is, you know. Well, here it's, it's more it's more about making the playoffs. 
because uh, the playoffs are what determine the league champions. So, I mean, that's really what what you're focused on is to get into that top seven to make the playoffs. Yeah, but I mean that, you know, MLS franchises are going to be a lot more bothered about how the MLS as a whole is doing. Um, and I think oh, in English, yes, yes. It, it's, it's really different because I think, you know, whether it's the EFL or whether it's the National League that we're probably going into, you know, they're pretty dreadful organizations at the end of the day. And it's a necessary evil. You know, you have to have a league. But really, you know, here, it's about your club. And at the end of the day, if if your club was told, well, you know, the only place that, that you can play football is the local park, you know, we'd probably still well, turn I think up. what it comes <laughs> down to is in, 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 the, in the U.S. that the, the teams are ultimately franchises of the league. In England, they're actually independent businesses. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and they're not just businesses, you know. They're so sort of well, of course. I, I was just on the, the most simplest level. Yeah, and I, I suppose what I would aspire to uh, for Stevenage is my sort of final thought, if you like. Before you give your final thought, I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed recording this series with you. It, it's just been you know fantastic the whole way. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I'm I'm very grateful to be invited. So, yeah, my final thought really is is as I've kind of travelled and I've gone to these kind of uh, away games up and down the country, and what I really notice is if you go to a town like Grimsby or whatever, you know, the way the town takes the team to its heart. So, you know, local shops will have, you know, um, messages wishing the club luck or, or shirts hung up, you know, things like that. And I, I just kind of wish that, you know, a few more people in East Hertfordshire, Central Hertfordshire would realise we have a great little local club uh, that we've built, you know, uh, and if you get behind us, you know, we are a kind of a unique clan in English football, I think. And uh, yeah, so I really hope that going forward, the club has done so much good over, you know, this uh, spring and summer, been out um, delivering sandwiches to to vulnerable people who haven't been able to leave the house uh, because of quarantine. So I hope that just more local people will kind of see the good that the club does for the area and say, you know, it's, it's not all about being in the Premier League. You know, there's there's a there's a value to a local team and um, and there's nothing like it. Absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head there. And that's what really kind of sold me on becoming a, a lower league football fan and wanting to get involved with a club like Accrington. Is it like you said, the club isn't just a business. It's actually part of the town part of the community and and every team you know my my fellow Accrington supporters may not all agree with me but uh, you know for the the good of the uh the Stevenage supporters like yourself I I wish nothing bad but good things for the club going forward and you know for for all clubs because like you said you know everybody has their story Everybody has their team that they're they're on their own journey with, and you know, e- even you know, I like I said earlier, I might always give a a hard time about the Spurs, but you know, I don't care. You know, even if you're a Spurs fan, you know, just you know, whoever your team is, you know, I, I want to see you know good things for everybody because we're we're all ultimately football fans out there. Yeah, yeah, and let's hope you know, that it's going to be sort of power to the well-run clubs in this game and that more clubs are going to become well-run. So we're not going to have to see, you know, Berries and Boltons and these kinds of things anymore. Or, or Wigan today going into to administration. Yeah. That, that's what we need to see is a, a strong and healthy football league so that the clubs can continue to make a difference to their community. Well, all right, Johnny, I have really enjoyed this, and I'm sure we'll have some more Belarus episodes. Thank you very much. Up the borough.